you hear me all right? Yeah, I'm Great. looking at your screen. Brilliant. Okay, yep. So today I'm going to talk about some stuff as uh, Andy mentioned yesterday. We've been looking at the influence of the mantle on uh, dynamics of the outermost core, in particular, the way it can form these lenses of um, stratified fluid near the top of the core where convection tends to get shot down uh, or shut down. And um, so today, uh, Andy, sorry, Andy looked at sort of the paleomagnetic implications. And today I'm talking to talk about work I've been doing with Chris Davies, looking more at sort of the short time scale dynamics and sort of, I guess what we might call geomagnetic um, implications of our, our models. Uh, and this is just an example of one of the simulations uh, with sort of flow, uh, radial flow in the colors and horizontal flows in the arrows near the top of the core and the corresponding uh, magnetic field. Um, we'll see more of these in a, in a bit. And so I guess the motivation for your, the work um, from uh, my side of things really came from seismology. I'm not a seismologist, but there's been a lot of work done over the years studying the seismology of the Edelman's core. And in particular, um, there's been a number of seismic studies that have shown the upper couple hundred kilometers of the core have an anomalous seismic structure where the seismic wave speeds are slow relative to what would be expected for PREM, where that would be a fully adiabatic core. And so if the core was fully convecting, we should have zero anomaly, but um, we have these um, anomalously slow regions at the top of the core, suggesting that the top of the core is not adiabatically or convectively well mixed all the way to the surface. Um, and that has been interpreted as a layer of stably stratified fluid uh, at the top of the core, perhaps a couple hundred kilometers thick. Um, and there's been a whole bunch of different mechanisms proposed to try and explain that. Either it's a primordial layer that's been there for the entirety of Earth's history, to having something to do with the way you know the core originally formed and differentiated um, from the mantle or impacts or injections from um, other bodies during the formation process, or that it is formed gradually over the age of the Earth due to either thermal or chemical effects um, gradually accumulating light material at the top of the core. Um, and in such a layer, you can have relatively little radial motion and that has implications then for the geomagnetic field because if we don't have radial motion near the top of the core, that changes what sort of geomagnetic signatures we might expect to see. Uh, and there are some oscillations of the geomagnetic field which are compatible with having a stratified layer. And so that's some work that by Bruce Buffett um, and colleagues looking at waves in such a layer and you can match things like fluctuations of the dipole moment um, by waves in such a layer. Um, however, there's a problem with having thick layers in comparing to the overall structure of Earth's magnetic field. Uh, and so on the right here, we have some simulations by Tom Agustin and co-authors where they've got dynamo simulations um, with different, and they've used, looked at a whole bunch of different simulations with different thicknesses or strengths of stratified layers at the top of the core. And so uh, here on the, on the left, we have Earth's present day um, magnetic field projected at the core mantle boundary. Um, and on the right, we have these simulations and you can see for a fully convective simulation, we have lots of small scale structures. So this is um, radial magnetic field in the, in the simulation um, at the core mantle boundary or at some depth. Um, and you can see that there's lots of small scale structure, but as you um, introduce an increasingly strongly stratified layer at the top of the core, the fact that that shuts down convection in the layer results in a much weaker and much smoother radial magnetic field at the top of the core. And you end up with something that at the top of the core just does not look very much like Earth's present day field. Um, and so what they did is they looked at measures of um, how well their simulated fields were matching Earth's magnetic field. And so again, here on the left, we have Earth's magnetic field now um, filtered to spherical harmonic degree eight, um, because that's sort of, we wanna look back in time, that's about um, the limit that we can get. And you can sort of see the typical structure of today's field, these high latitude flux patches that we've heard about before, the South Atlantic anomaly, for example, some patches near the equator. Um, and you can construct various um, 
mathematical descriptions of the structure of the Earth's field, how axial dipolar it is, how much flux is concentrated into patches, how zonal it is, um, the structure of odd versus even harmonics of the uh, spectrum of the field. Uh, and the in these plots, the for those four different um, measures, Earth's um, present day field is the blue dashed line and sort of what's considered a reasonable um, range of Earth-like properties is sort of in the shaded region. And what Gastin et al. showed was that for three of the four um, measures, um, basically once you get a stratified layer in your simulations that's say 50 kilometers thick, you're just not able to match um, those measures of the Earth magnetic field, the field that you get too weak, too smooth, wrong sort of um, physical structure. Uh, they do okay in flux concentration, but the other three, um, they fail. Uh, and then sort of the overall semblance of the field given in the colors of these simples, um, anything over eight is considered not very good. And so most of these are, you know, well above eight. And so they're just, they would be considered non-Earth-like fields. And so we have this problem that the seismology suggests that we have fields that are strongly stratified several hundred kilometers thick. But if we try and run simulations with those models, um, we get um, magnetic fields that just are not Earth-like in their structure. Um, but what all of these models don't uh, include is the fact that um, we should not expect the outer boundary of the core to be a homologous, have homologous boundary conditions. Again, Andy mentioned this last time. We know that uh, the mantle is convecting, so we've got you know a complicated convective thermal convective processes going on in the mantle on very long time scales, including these large low velocity provinces, which are some kind of combination of thermal and chemical anomaly in the lowermost mantle, um, which we can see in uh, mantle topography models. So this is uh, shear wave velocity, and we can see the African and the Pacific. Sorry, wrong way around, African and the Pacific large low velocity provinces, which are exactly what they are is still open to debate, but they have at least some amount of thermal component. So they are anomalously hot. If they are anomalously hot, then less heat can escape the top of the core underneath our large low velocity provinces. And so if you do a little bit of mineral physics, you can get a map convert your seismic velocity map into a heat flux map. And so this is what you might expect the pattern of heat escaping the top of the core to look like, um, where it is low and perhaps even zero underneath the large low velocity problems. You just cannot extract heat from the core there. And so hot fluid will accumulate in lenses underneath these large low velocity provinces and you'll sort of not have the active convection. Um, and this is what we refer to as these regional inversion lenses um, at the top of the core. And so what we did was we um, have put those um, lenses into, uh, or not those lenses, but that heterogeneous um, heat flux into our simulations for, as Andy said, we've looked at six different simulations, ones where there are the homogeneous um, boundary conditions, so no lateral variations in heat flux out of the top of the core, and then ones where we have increasing amounts of um, mantle heterogeneity um, and therefore influence on the dynamics of the core. Um, and as you increase that mantle influence, we start forming these thick regions, these thick lenses of basically stably stratified fluid um, at the top of the core, which can be up to a few hundred kilometers thick. You then get preferential downwelling where you don't have those stable lenses, where you have cold slabs above the core mantle boundary extracting more heat that tends to promote convection and downwelling. The lateral variations in temperature uh, drive thermal winds, which set up persistent um, flows at the top of the core, which gives us then um, non-zonal structure in both the flows and the magnetic fields. And so this is an example sort of time average fields. And you can see um, flux patches at high latitudes for example, forming in the models that have these mantle influence, but not in the models that don't. In the models that don't, you just sort of have this sort of relatively standard looking um, dipole field. And so if we come back to our sort of thinking about does this actually solve our problem? So we've got some structure, it looks different than um, models with a stratified layer, but does it still look Earth-like? 
Um, and the good news is it does. And so this is now um, um, our models evaluated with, again, these um, uh, geometric um, comparisons to Earth's magnetic field. So now the stars are the Gastine et al. results and the other symbols are our results, circles for where there is no mantle influence, triangles for where there's a little bit and um, uh, pentagons where there is more. Um, and as you can, and this is an example from one of ours. And so this is showing where the lenses form. And so these sort of gray to green uh, regions are the African regional inversion lens and the Pacific regional inversion lens um, in the uppermost core where we have the sort of a stably stratifying temperature gradient being imposed on the core by the mantle. And then in terms of the structure of the field, we have, um, again, these symbols, we can see that um, they don't always fit exactly within um, Earth-like band, which is now in the, in the green band, but we can have um, cases where we've got strong stratification. So these regional version lenses, 200 to 300, kilometers thick and um, matching all of the um, characteristics of Earth's magnetic field um, within acceptable levels. Um, again, as I say, not always, not all models work, but we do get models uh, that work regardless of this. And so we can have both thick stratification at the top of the core, at least regionally, and Earth-like magnetic fields as judged by these, um, these criteria. The one that we have the hardest time is, is still flux concentration. Uh, and we can look at how these vary through time. So this is sort of time average. The, these left panels are sort of time averaged measures of how well is our field doing. But I guess it's important to note that the field is can be quite variable through time. And so even if on average, the field doesn't look particularly Earth-like, it can still have um, extended periods where it is very Earth-like. And so for example, um, this, uh, second case is with a gray triangle um, colored by how well it does overall. Like there are times when it is not very Earth-like um, running over sort of 60,000 model years of simulation, right? So there are times of, you know, thousands of years where it is not very Earth-like. So it's above this um, higher most line, but there are also thousands of years where it has what would be considered a good or excellent match to Earth's magnetic field. And so the variability of the field is important to consider when doing these sorts of comp, comp, uh, co co comparisons between simulations and Earth's magnetic field, um, because we only have you know very good um, estimates of Earth's magnetic field for the last 400 years in terms of these sort of making these sorts of very direct comparisons, um, and both the Earth's field and your simulations might vary a lot through time. Um, and then other cases, right, they might look very Earth-like all of the time or just have brief excursions where they are not very Earth-like. But overall, um, we can have, you know, this increased mantle heterogeneity uh, is not incompatible with the Earth's magnetic field, unlike the layered cases. And um, again, this is the case that Andy talked about yesterday where, you know, um, for this high Rayleigh number case, um, without the mantle heterogeneity, the homogeneous case is in this sort of constantly reversing case, so it's very unlike Earth's present day field. But when you put on some mantle heterogeneity, it stabilizes the structure of the field, it stabilizes the field, the constant reversals go away, and you end up with something that is very Earth-like for tens of thousands of years of, of model simulation time. And so we have these uh, collection of models, and this is now looking at a snapshot, so 400 year um, average now sort of compared with the GOFM model. Uh, so GOFM, the field and secular variation on the left, this simulation um, in the middle for the field structure, and then its flow structure on the right. And so you can see that the fields look, again, quite similar in terms of there's high latitude flux patches, there's quiet Pacific secular variation, um, and there are, are large scale flows that are similar to things that are seen in the simulations. This um, eccentric gyre, which was also mentioned yesterday, where you've got um, westward flow over the equatorial Atlantic, and then it diverts uh, polewards at American longitudes and then sort of uh, skirts around the Pacific before coming back down um, over sort of Central Asia and Africa to sort of then join up again. And so we've got this sort of large scale flows. Um, that you can see uh, and in 
in this stimulation, rel mostly relatively weak flows over the Pacific relating to the relatively weak secular variation. Although, um, although this particular snapshot has weak secular variation over the Pacific, it's not true that all snapshots from this model have weak secular vari variation over the Pacific. So if um, some of these features like weak specific secular variation are you know, very long lived um, features of the field or the South Atlantic anomaly, if those are very long lived features of the field, whether or not these simulations um, would produce that, I'm not so sure. Um, there is, in addition to the high latitude flux patches, there's interesting structure at low latitudes in these simulations. A lot of work has been done in the past talking about the high latitude flux patches. I would note we also have persistent reverse flux patches um, in the uh, near the equator uh, in these simulations. So all of the heterogeneous simulations tend to have these pairs of reverse flux patches uh, at the equator um, under the Americas and sort of in the Indian Ocean. And this is associated with places where um, convection is promoted and downwelling is promoted at the top of the cores. And so that might give a way of producing persistent South Atlantic anomalies um, in these simulations, for example, <clears throat> or at least recurrent, if not persistent. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so that's a summary of the things that we have done and that we have found. We get um, with strong mantle heterogeneity, we get uh, strong influence on the top of the core formation of these regional inversion lenses under Africa and the Pacific, which are sort of quite extensive and perhaps several hundred kilometers thick, um, impacts on the magnetic field in terms of these reverse flux patches at equatorial latitudes, high flux patches at um, high latitudes, um, et cetera, eccentric gyres. And I guess the key from my point of view is that um, this might give a way to match both the seismic observations of having thick non convective or non fully mixed structures at the top of the core and matching our geomagnetic observations of the structure of Earth's magnetic field. And with that, I will thank you for listening and take any questions. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, we've got two questions in the chat. Uh, one of them is an ancient impactor or on your slide. It was not sufficiently clear if this impactor would need to penetrate mantle to influence the course uh, stratification. Can you be more specific on how your envision envi uh, how you envision ancient impactor uh, processes? Yeah, so there's a couple of different uh, ideas that are sort of similar. One is just that um, during differentiation of the core from the mantle it might happen through various stages. And if the redox conditions in the mantle change through time, then the partitioning of light elements into the iron might be different. And so the, as the core forms, um, you would get drips of different types of material entering the core. Or if you have um, you know, impactors just delivering different material to the mantle, um, that by the time it makes it to the core, um, it will have a different chemical composition and therefore um, give you a layer at the top of the core, which could be um, chemically distinct and there stay, stay there. So you don't necessarily need the impactor to go all the way through the mantle and reach the core. You just need it to deliver anomalous material to the proto-earth, which then when it reaches the core is chemically distinct and light from um, compared to what was already there. And then it would accumulate at the top and in principle could be quite, um, resistant to erosion uh, by underlying convection in the core. Okay, uh, got a few more questions coming in, but the second one from is in your simulations, do you consider Coriolis cor uh, forces? If you do, what is the period of uh, cause spinning in your calculation? Uh, yeah, so yeah, we've got Coriolis forces in there um, as uh, indicated non-dimensionally by the Ekman number. So our Ekman numbers are 10 to the minus five, um, which gets us down into the region as Andy discussed yesterday, where it is rotationally dominated. Um, and so I don't have any pictures of um, the structure of the flow, but you can see in the structure of the flow there, you get that sort of typical columnar flow aligned with the rotation axis um, at depth. Um, what that means in terms of uh, 
period of rotation rate. I mean, it's still very non-Earth-like in terms of how fast it's spinning. Um, our, you know, the Earth's Ackermann number is possibly 10 to the minus 15, and we're 10 to the minus 5, but we're at least low enough that we get into a place where we are rotationally dominated for the, the dynamics. If you look at this, the, the force spectrum, the force balance, uh, it is rotationally dominated, um, unlike um, things like Ekman 10 to the minus four. And you can also look at it in terms of the, the Rossby number um, is, uh, you know, it's, uh, 10 to the minus two. So it's much, you know, much smaller than one. Uh, so it's rotationally dominated, if not yet completely Earth-like. Uh, so the third question is, is the issue with seismological observations that they always uh, sample the same spatially limited parts of the outer core? I think so. Uh, and so um, with luck, we will have a project um, starting to look at that. Uh, but certainly like the, you know, with the seismic observations that like you're limited to where earthquakes happen and where you have stations. And so they tend to oversample per parts of the core and not sample other parts of the core. So you get lots of sampling you know, across the Pacific when you have, um, you, know, you know, earthquakes in Tonga, Fiji that then are recorded in North America. So that samples the Pacific a lot or earthquakes um, off the coast of South America that are sampled in Japan. Again, you sample the Pacific a lot, but not other places, right? And so there's a definite sampling bias. Um, and there is some indication that there are regional variations in the data that people just haven't looked at it because the idea was that um, the core should be well mixed. And so you just do a 1D average um, and sort of ignore the regional variations. And so we're hoping to look at whether or not there are regional variations in the seismic data. There's some indications that there might be. Okay. And the fourth question is, is the heterogeneity of the stratified layer as RILs seen in seismology observations, is that something we can see? Uh, so whether or not the regional inversion layers lenses in our, our simulations would actually be seismically visible, we don't know um, because we don't yet have, we haven't yet run thermal chemical models again on our to-do list um, because to get seismically visible variations you would need to have a chemical component. So our simulations are only looking at the thermal effects so far. So we've got these thermal boundary conditions and that leads to thermal stratification. If it also led to um, uh, chemical enrichment in, in the lenses, which it might well do if they're sort of stagnant layers, then once you have chemical enrichment uh, into those lenses, it might not escape. Um, then that could in principle give you um, seismically observable um, uh, lenses with the same strength as as seen um, seismically. Um, I guess it is a problem that a lot of the um, uh, proposals for stratified layers also have is getting a layer that is as thick and as strong as suggested by um, the seismology. A lot of the um, proposals for things that build up through time that rely on sort of chemical diffusion um, have a hard time having a strong thick layer. And so it, you know, that's another reason why we were interested in this problem is it's, it's very not clear how you could in any way form something seismically distinct at the top of the core. Um, so in principle, we might be able to do it, but we don't know yet because we've not yet run the simulations to see whether or not we get that chemical signal that you probably need. <laughs>